Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Scubana e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Scubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation. Today, I'm excited. I'm talking to Eddie Lickstini, co-founder of Autoplicity.com with Sean McWhorter, which sells car parts. They took the company from zero to $50 million in four years. I suggest anyone follow his Quora posts. They're very in-depth. He's also the founder of THMotorsports.com that sells car parts that celebrated 10 years and over 100,000 customers and is also co-founder of Rejoiner.com with Mike Arsenal, which is an email marketing automation software for e-commerce companies. Eddie, thanks for joining me. Hey, thanks very much for having me. That's like a big, big mouthful of stuff. Yeah, it is. I realize my LinkedIn profile must be just like <laughs> way too long. I'll cut it down. No, you know, and it's, there's probably like 10 other sites that I, I do a lot of research. There's probably 10 other sites that you own that I didn't find. Um, but I always like to start with a fun fact. And a fun fact about you before we get into some of the, basically how you got from zero to 50 million in four years, which we want yeah. to talk about, um, is you're an avid lover of feel-good movies of the 90s and you could rewatch movies unlimited times. What's Absolutely. the movie that you've watched the most amount of times? I think the two contenders are Ferris Bueller's Day Off mm -hmm. and then My Cousin Vinny. Okay. Each watch in their own segments. Ferris Bueller's Day Off is more of a Saturday morning show. And then, oh, like, eh, crap, I even call it a show because how, how many times I've actually watched it. And then uh, My Cousin Vinny, I used to I used to work in New York and I'd watch it almost every single day and eat my lunch. Uh, and it would just like play on my laptop over and over. You So, you know, before we hit play... Um, I wanted to know what's top of mind, what you want to discuss, what you think is most important. You said something really interesting, and you talked about building a legacy, building a brand. Um, talk yeah. about that. So you and I kind of touched upon that. Uh, a lot of what I contribute on Quora is guiding people, especially the newbies in the entrepreneurship world or the e-commerce world, yeah. is to build something that helps others. So just kind of coming out and regurgitating the same thing. So whether you're making a product or reselling something else, mm -hmm. coming out and just making the exact same thing for a buck less, you're not really helping anyone out. You're not mm -hmm. really helping market out. Yeah. You're just trying to kind of yeah. steal the back. Yeah, you use the phrase on your core posts a bunch of times, race to the bottom, which I like. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, that's the old AT&T MCI game where you're going to just – keep cutting down, cutting down until there's nothing left. Mm -hmm. And you see that a lot on Amazon. You see that a lot with people who are competing on building a product where, you know, they may have the same type of like, I don't know, slicer of some sort. And the next guy's just looking to make it for a dollar less in China. And it doesn't really help the consumer, but people know how to game the system to get reviews and grow the products up. You know, that's one thing that I always advocate, try to make something new. Yeah. And then when you build your own brand, it's really easy in e-commerce off the bat to make money. Buy low, sell high. Pretty simple mentality. But what happens after that is more difficult. And if you continuously just do that, let's say you built your entire business on Amazon, no one really knows who you are. So after 10 years, the only thing you can do is shut down. No one really – well, some people claim that you can sell for a huge multiple. I've seen that. Uh, I don't believe in the same. I've been in the – some shoes of the VC guys, and it just is not really appealing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, you know, talk about that for a second. I find this interesting you say that um, because, so how do you differentiate yourself with car parts? So we today, yeah. so we have two entities. Uh, we have TH Motorsports and Autoplicity, yeah. which are both ran separately. Mm -hmm. uh, TH Motorsports is now 13 years old maybe even 14, no, 13, 13 years old, and its basis was social marketing. So everything that you know about social, we were doing way, way back in the day. And it was started in a really simple manner where... Why did you start I, it in the first place? Uh, I love cars. So yeah. I'm a huge automotive aficionado. Yeah. And 
I was on forums. That was the first place that I could find information. Like I wasn't a mechanic. There wasn't really many places to go on. But there was this great group. Uh, specifically, I had a 2001 Honda Civic was car number one for it. I and had a 2000 Honda Accord. Yeah. 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 I feel like a lot of people just had a Honda at some point in their life. Right. And uh, yeah, I just got this knack to do something unique with it. I didn't want to drive the exact same car that everyone else did. So the only place that I found was the forum. And on the forum, it was just alive. People were chatting, going back and forth. Mm. Parts. So you wanted to soup it up. Absolutely. That was the time where Fast and Furious came out too. So okay. this is like hand in hand. I mean, I love cars since I was a little kid. Uh, but this is exactly the same time. And the school that I went to, like high school wise, we were really – Automotive driven school, a lot of like kids drag race stuff like that. Really? So, yeah. So you used to drag race in high school? I mean, I can't legally say that, right? <laughs> I don't know, actually. I, I can maybe. You, you plead the fifth on that one. Yeah, just up here. So, what's the uh, fastest you've ever driven a car? Uh, legally on a track, probably about 170, 180 miles an hour. Wow. Something of that nature. Yeah. Uh, I'm not really huge on like top line speed, more on uh, circular track or something with multiple turns would okay. be the more fun part. But okay. anyways, kind of circling back to where we were, yeah. uh, just kind of got this knack to actually modify the car. At the same time, I just started college. I was uh, in the entrepreneurship club. Uh, I went to University of Illinois, Chicago at a very small entrepreneurship club. Uh, within like half a year, I became the president of it. Mm. Most people just signed up for credits. I actually thought it was an interesting thing to take part of. And there was a once a year, it's kind of like a seminar. I think it still goes on. Uh, if you're a Chicago native, for yeah. whoever's listening, it was at Navy, uh, Navy Pier. Right, yeah. And you kind of, it just bit, like the bug bit me. I wanted to do something. Yeah. And uh, I was already selling books for a few people. I sold a lot of stuff on eBay. That was like how I made money on the side. Mm. Uh, so I thought, okay, why don't I try this in the car park world? And my first supplier was actually a competitor who I was buying from uh, on the forum. So that's TH Motorsports. That's how it differentiates. It still to this day has a really big presence on the social side. And mm. that, doesn't ext that extends outside of just forums that can yeah. be on Facebook. What we do is we try to help people. So what our big differentiator is from the Amazons of the world, as yeah. a lot of people like to say, is we are gearheads, we employ ASC techs. It's people who know the nuts and bolts, who can help you with a huge ten, twenty thousand dollar engine build and get you on the track, or they can help you with something simple. Mm -hmm. uh, Autoplicity is a little bit different of a play. So Autoplicity's value add is you have the largest aggregation of automotive parts yeah. online in one spot. Yeah. So it is kind of like the Amazon of automotive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a site that works really well, fluid, fast, easy to find stuff. And you can go on and buy a bumper, a distributor. You can get floor mats. And if it's a truck, you can get a winch for it all at the same time. Right. So that's kind of uh, our value add to the world when it comes to autoplicity. At what point did you start autoplicity? Autoplicity is now four years old. Hmm. Uh, it was kind of the brainchild of wanting to expand. So TH Motorsports focuses on sport compact. That's, again, back to uh, the Fast and Furious old school days. It now does a little bit more than that, but yeah. uh, that's its roots. And I just really wanted to expand. I remember going to the SEMA convention, and every year I would kind of hang out with all the sport compact uh, companies and areas and then I saw that they were just minute in comparison to the rest of the market. Then I started doing research. It was a $300 billion market. I said, okay, we need to scale up quick. And that's where I got shot. So TH Motorsports, um, what did it look like e-commerce-wise 10 years ago? What were some of the things that, you, that worked then? And then what, what started to work as the internet grew? I mean, 10 years ago is like, Stone Ages oh. of the Internet. Yeah. Uh, that's, you know, sometimes I'll jump on uh, Wayback Time Machine. Yeah. And so TH Motorsports originally was called TrueHonda.com. Okay. Uh, hence the T and the H. There was a period of ah, time. I was wondering what the TH was for, yeah. Yeah. There was a time where uh, everyone had a very unique name, and then they used a trademark of some kind of automotive brand. 
And somewhere around year two of running True Honda, you got the letter from the manufacturer that said, You cannot use their name. Use the name. Because, you know, they were kind of new to the internet too. So they let it slide for a little bit. So what everyone did is they just conjugated the name. Just took whatever you had and added in motorsports. Um, I got you. Wouldn't recommend that to people. Not very SEO friendly. <laughs> a ton of people with blank, blank motorsports. Right. Um, so what did it look like? What were you what, doing to, to sell then? That's a, that's a very interesting question. And that's something that is kind of part of our company, Credo. You hear um, a guy that like was on my bucket list, Gary Vaynerchuk, to speak to. Yeah. Uh, he speaks about running it like a 1950s butcher shop where you know who's coming through the door. Service, service, service. Right. That's what we started with. Mm-hmm. We were on forums, or let me rephrase, when I always say we, it was just I at the time. Right. I was on forums and a few other people joined on there after. We would just help people out. It was like, honest to goodness, help. We wanted people to persevere with their cars. I loved having anyone take my advice and be able to mod their car, be happy with it, send me a smiley chat me up. I mean, I had a lot of random e-friends that I've never spoken to, but I knew everyone really, really well. Yeah. And throughout the years, we kind of, you know, as I was 19 when I started, so I kind of fell into the hole of let me just kind of take, you know, a wad of spaghetti and throw it at the wall and see what sticks. Right. Yeah. Uh, so so, yeah, so what's stuck? Yeah. So I said, let's work on SEO. So one year we employed an SEO company and worked on that. Didn't get very far. Then another year I said, okay, we need a race team. So in 2010, we had like a full blown race team. Really? It was a TV series that unfortunately never aired. It had the uh, director from Jersey Shore on it. I mean, it was like a full production thing. Mm. I didn't know anything about TV. Clearly, it didn't go anywhere. It was piloted once on Speed Channel, and then it died. It sounds cool, though. It was cool to take yeah. part of. It was really expensive and very nerve-wracking. But Expensive and a waste of your time, but it sounds cool. If anyone you know, anyone listening is into automotive racing or wants to get into it, I think aside from airplane racing and maybe rocket ship racing, that is the most cost-intensive sport. Mm. It's really easy to lose couple hundred thousand dollars a year without even flinching on it yeah uh if you're in pro get that checkbook out because it's all millions but anyways racing aside you know we would do some other things like uh we would work just one year straight on conversion nothing else and what i realized is that took our focus away from the core value of the company Hmm. which was service so we've done a full 360 and today we are still very active on social. Yeah. We want to focus even more on helping people out with car parts, with advice on their car. Uh, and that you know now becomes even more prevalent for things like Facebook marketing. Now we're in this time where people talk about like the quality of content. And it's not just about the length of your content. It's how good it is and how much you can help. And like, you know, contributing to core is no different than what we were doing when we were contributing to the automotive world. Right. So that's what still works. That's true. Because when I read your post, I'm like, this guy writes, you're writing paragraphs and paragraphs of paragraphs of helping someone that's you know, all that, we did. that you don't know. It's literally all that we ever did was we just really wanted to help people out. So right now with the TH Motorsports, what works is going back to your roots and going on social media and helping people. Yep. What, what is your process for that? Like, do you go, okay, from this time to this time, we're going to go on Facebook and we're, you know, there's, I'm sure you have a process set up that yeah. allows you to respond. So for people who are like, this seems overwhelming. There's a million social media. What do you do to actually hone in on the people who need your help and then actually respond? So you're not spending the whole day, which you could probably spend the whole day responding to people. Well, I used to, you know, probably about six years, six or seven years ago, uh, we have now uh, three full-time staff or bringing on a fourth, and they spend all day uh, on social media, mm. uh, whether it be forums or Facebook, but they are social selling as well, and they're taking phone calls. So if you want to knock that part out, if you knock out the phone call side, your best bet uh, for someone who's starting out who wants to contribute on social is find something that you're good at. So that's the first part. 
like hands down, make sure that you're in some way, shape, or form a specialist. Yeah. You know, if you are great at whittling wood, contribute at whittling wood. Right. Uh, the best thing to do is actually answer questions for people rather than just writing up your own blog posts. You know, you see a lot of people today sit and write blog posts and then they have to market them. That's a really big effort. Yeah. You know, that's basically you creating your own online consultative business. Yeah. If you can answer people's questions, you know, go on forums if they're still It relevant. sounds so simple, but it's so true. Yeah. Go to the section that you're really good at and mm. just become the authority there. Be the guy that answers everyone's questions and just continuously do that. You will pick up traction. Mm. It is an organic way of succeeding. Yeah. It is not short. There's no shortcuts to it. Right. You have to be likable. You know, if you're in no way, shape, and form kind of like the personality of a people pleaser, you probably won't like it because um, you won't really get that gratitude where someone says thank you. You probably won't get thank yous for a long time. Right. But you'll get followers yeah. uh, if you're going to be on something like a Twitter or a Facebook. If you're on a forum, people will directly respond to you. Yeah. Forums are not, you know, no longer as prevalent. They're more of just knowledge bases. Yeah. But that's a perfect opportunity for the person who's starting out to be able to actually give that knowledge to the world and then have it be indexable, which yeah. is really huge. There's your little SEO play yeah. that can come back with that. Yeah. Eddie, when did you first start to get traction? Like you said, you could go years without a thank you. When did you first start getting traction for TH Motorsports? Uh, if you contribute, you know, one of the things that we were doing, we were selling right away as well. Yeah. So what were the, some of the initial products that you were selling? Oh, I can remember this very well. The very first product we ever sold was I wanted something that was unique that no one could sell, and I wanted to find a pain point in the market. Yeah. Uh, the most popular thing for that car at the time was this turbo kit. Okay. It was very expensive. you got to figure this was a car that was brand new, $16,000, $17,000 in 2001. Yeah. So call it like a $25,000 car of today. Yeah. That turbo kit, which made the car quite more powerful, was around $3,500. Uh, call it $4,500 today. Yeah. And it's it like twenty percent of the cost of the car ish. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was sold by two guys. It was called Stafford Fabrications. Okay. Two, two Mikes, Mike and Mike. Uh, and I think it's either Mike and Mike or they were both Stafford brothers, one of the two. But they were horrible about customer service. So they would, you know, it would take like a year to build one. Uh, really? Usually, oh yeah. Wow. They had the production time was awful. So I said, okay. What can I do? Where can I be a value add? Yeah. I can take this turbo kit and then I can be the service liaison. So I can p keep people updated. I will be the one-stop shop. So if you want to buy it, you buy it through me. And then I'll keep you updated through the whole process and make sure that you have that you know warm and fuzzy feeling right. at the end of the day. And that was the first product that we ever sold. And we probably sold about 35 of them or 40 of them in the first year. Wow. Uh, all payments were taken by check. I mean, it was super old school. And uh, it was a lot of years of agonizing updates because I dealt with a very, very bad supplier. <laughs> um, what was the next major milestone for you? So that was the first product. What was what was the next milestone in the business? So we were only in Honda. It was true Honda.com. Right. Uh, the website was built by a guy at school at UIC or yeah. University of Illinois Chicago. Yeah. I, you know, I follow that traditional make a flyer and staple it all over, all over school <laughs> and someone will, you know, pick it up. And this guy did and he built a, he literally built a platform from scratch. Really? Yeah. I don't even know what it was coded on. I have no clue to this day. He just kind of built it, set it and forget it. He actually had an interesting story where uh, he got caught by the FBI. He used the same server that we were on to hack the Dare website. Are you serious? Yeah, so apparently he was like a major hacker. There. Yeah, really strange. But uh, he hacked. He used that, and then off of that, he got arrested. Uh, he got kicked out of school, and then he got picked up by Apple. So that's what I heard. I could all be completely. BS. And, uh, <laughs> so uh, he he put this site together, and so then what happened next? Together, it had three hundred products. It was impossible to manage them. I remember this back end; it was like horrific. Uh, and 
the how next, many suppliers did you have at the time for the 300 we had, product? We had one. Oh, supplier. that was one. So the one with the bad customer service? We had one for the bad customer service. And then for a few of the other parts that we sold, the other 299 of them, uh, I used our competitor. So he would compete directly against me, actually usually selling at a lower price. He'd sell to me at like 5% below cost. Yeah. And I was unfortunately that guy in the market who was like the kid in his basement who was making five points, just happy to do it, uh, and buying from his competitor. And the first time the big epiphany came was I figured out what a distributor was. And that was like an official supply chain channel. Right. Uh, so when that came on, we grew with our distributor, uh, who we're still really great partners with today. And they introduced us to new markets. So then True Honda started to become like True Nissan and a few others. It didn't really hold that name. Uh, we switched the name to TH Motorsports at the time and started breaking into different markets. So but we you understood. owned all those sites at one point, like True Honda, True Nissan. No, I was just. Oh, you didn't. Oh, I got yeah, you. Okay. The rest were all under the TH Motorsports yeah. brand, uh, but it gave us the ability to be in the social world, yeah, uh, other places. So it it taught me that the approach that we had was packageable to different markets in yeah. the automotive segment, and that's how we grew. So how did you get traction? Now you, I mean, you have these 300 products on your site. Now how do you get people to buy the products? It was all off forms. We all had forms. No organic presence. I gotcha. None. Uh, we ran when we expanded markets to Nissan to Subaru. Our website still had 300 Honda products. We actually ran two years without having an official website to support those products. Really. Only on you'd have the picture on a forum post, mm. and then would, people would pay us through PayPal. Uh, Google Checkout used to have this cool thing where you could send an invoice, and they can pay by credit card. So it yeah. was like a virtual shopping cart, and we didn't really talk exist. about minimum viable product, right? Yeah, <laughs> you don't even need a website. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time. I mean, that stuff doesn't fly. Today. It's very personal, though. It's almost like Craigslist, where you're selling a car, and you just like take a couple pictures and. Except you do it virtually. Yeah. So when was the next major milestone in the business where you're like, wow, this is a business. Like you went from your basement making 5% yeah. to the next level. When was that that point? Uh, so once we brought on our distributor, uh, we understood that there was more distribution in line. At that time, we launched a website that had 100,000 products versus just 300 uh, and that really changed the game very quickly. Mm. That's when I started to understand, you know, you need to build a site properly, what conversion's about, or the world of CRO. I mean, a lot of those things to me at the time didn't have a specific name. Right. But just marketing in general. Right. So that's when things started to change around. Yeah. How do you and manage? I mean, you said it was hard to manage 300 products. Then how do you manage 100,000 products? Uh, it's market demand. So we would still focus, you know, it's that 80-20 rule, but in this case it was the 90-10 rule. So we would definitely focus more on the products that we would sell. And then we kind of had like the split in two. So from the social side, it was very specific. You knew exactly what we were selling. When it came to the website, a uh, big driver at the time was Google Shopping when it was free. Mm-hmm. And you can pretty much put up everything. So that's what we did. You know, we just said we have a supplier. They have the products. We're going to put them up on Google Shopping. There's our marketing. Uh, aside with, you know, maybe what else did we do throughout the time? Uh, we did some affiliate stuff. Uh, we did some other C automotive-only CSEs, comparisons to shopping engines. And that's pretty much it. So they kind of ran like side by side. Yeah. That's how you gain traction for it. So... Eddie, what should people know about increasing conversion on their site? What do you do that works? Uh, I am a big believer of trust. Okay. So prove who you are yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. Because um, I was studying your site and I'm like, obviously, this guy's been doing it for a long time. He knows what he's doing. So what things should people have on that page? Because I see, you know, if you go to your site, the trust is there, right? You have as seen on NBC Sports. Immediately, you know what NBC is. You have 10-year 10, 10 anniversary, right? Yeah. So, like, those type of things is what you're talking about or, or what else? 
Yeah, you can. Those trust symbols are usually a really great factor to help someone get again that warm and fuzzy feeling mm-hmm. inside uh, when it comes to actually wanting to buy uh, proper reviews off-site. So you know, there's a myriad of sites that can collect reviews and collect reviews honestly. Mm-hmm. Uh, you really want to do that, whether it be like a reseller rating or I think there's power reviews. I mean, there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, that's a, a big driver for conversion. Yeah. Where I see it from my side. I mean, you can go as deep as colors of buttons. Yeah. You Talk about a little bit of get get geek out for a second on conversion. Like minutia. Yeah. Like Whatever you think is important. If if you don't think it's important, don't worry about it. But I was having the conversation this morning with a, a big e-commerce store, and this is was the exact conversation. He's like, I have this product page. I want to optimize it. And that's what he's looking at doing. So what advice would you give him to look at without, obviously you, you have to look at the individual page, but. So big maybe. winners, uh, big winners to me, if, you know, if you ever look at a site that does this really well, mm-hmm. uh, you could look at, you know, some of our friends like at AmericanMuscle.com. Mm-hmm. Every single page that they have is really rich in content. Mm-hmm. So capture the person on the page. Abandonment rate is huge, right? In today's world, 70% plus, 80%, you're on mobile, it's even worse. Um, hence rejoining. Are, is that... Hence rejoining. Right, yeah. So, yeah, you're jumping on a page. If you're coming off of like a CSC, you're landing directly on the product page already. You have just one chance to tell an entire story and help convert that person all at the same time. In so two, how do you do In two seconds, right. Yeah, two seconds before they click back and check another price or something like that. So... In today's world, I see conversion as engage the customer mm-hmm. as much as you can. Mm-hmm. So start solving pain points for yeah, them. Yeah. Uh, why is the person going on your page? Do they just need a price? Cool. If they're just looking for a price, display on your page the prices of some of your other competitors if you legally can. That way, they don't need to bounce out. Yeah. There's one thing that you can do. Yeah. Uh, if you want to, if you're having a customer come to your page because they're interested in the product itself, get a video up there. Show it in full. You know, a huge write-up is great, but people run out of gusto. They're not going to have the time to read, you know, like 40 paragraphs on exactly what this product does. Right. Give the key points, put on a video. Uh, if you have something that is applicable where you have the product in hand, do an opening box video. Show people what it's like. Hold it. You know, twist it around by the camera. Yeah. Give people an idea. That will inherently give you authority. Um, if you really want to go a step above and beyond, if you're reselling someone else's product, have the man- someone at the manufacturer either film the video, if you can do that, or have the manufacturer contribute directly onto the page. Once again, co-branding with more authority. Mm. Once you do that and you put it out there that you have this great service level, the person doesn't really need to leave, and then they're not. they're more... Uh, price elastic. Yeah. They can, they're happy to pay a little bit more with you because they see that you are a specialist. You have yeah. all this knowledge in the product. You'll be able to help them out, and that's what you can do with one page. Right. Uh, that's my big part of conversion. When you know you're going on to the, the checkout sign. I think on the show you had before, uh, you had Neil Patel on the show. Yeah. You know, I know Neil's company does work for Amazon. Uh, I'm pretty sure they're in the CRO space for Amazon with them. And if you ever want to see what one of the best checkouts looks like, look at Amazon. Right. You know, start studying where you can hit the home page, where the link deactivates, yeah. colors, time, size of pictures. I mean right. you, they've you done get, all the testing and spent tons of money doing that. Yeah. yeah. I mean when you get into the really, really, really detailed aspects. I mean, that's where you want to look at the big sites that compete against you. Right. Just what you can take away from them. Yeah. No, I like how you keep highlighting Eddie pain points, you know, from choosing a product to on the page. What is a pain point that you saw only because you're in the industry that you saw that you needed to highlight in a particular page because you knew the customer that maybe most people wouldn't have thought about? What are some pain that's- points? So that was the biggest one, and yeah. that's you know this is something that we do on Autoplicity yeah. is we thought okay what why do people go on a CSC comparison shopping engine so you know call it Google Shopping we'll go back to that sorted by price 
you're kind of you're stuck with a really hard choice, right? Like I'm trying to buy a PlayStation, and there's five places that sell a PlayStation. All five of them have over two thousand reviews. They're between a four and a five. Where do I choose? Right. Okay, their prices are decently similar. I mean, Sony's going to have map pricing, so it's all going to be the same. But you're within, you know, uh, let's say all the pricing is the same, right. uh, or it's off by a little bit. How do you differentiate yeah. the players? Right. So you click on each site. You have to go through the value ads. If the prices are different, why would you want people to click back and forth from all of them? We got people onto our site, and we show people are the top competitors and their pricing. Yeah. So we tell them there's no reason to leave. You can see if you're just going on price, here's the competition. Go for it. So that was kind of like a pain point that we took away mm. uh, that we run with as of today. Mm -hmm. uh, on the TH Motorsports side, I'm sure we've done things that were in regards to fitment. So fitment for automotive vehicles is a very important thing. Uh, you get things like clutch kits, which have a spline count, and that spline count has to be exact. And there's a car that's made in the same year, but halfway through the year they switched it, so there's mm. one, one spline count, one has another. If you can have that detailed information, you are ex instantly yeah. branded expert. Someone's oh, branded. for sure. Like I don't even know what a spline count is. It'd be like these people know what they're talking okay. about. <laughs> I'm sold just on that word. Like I don't even know what that is. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. What about, what are some of the big challenges? What were some of the big challenges of TH Motorsports? Uh, you know, I can tell you that TH Motorsports had a very interesting challenge that it had a bulk of its business in Google Shopping. And that used to be free. And then in, I think, May, April or May of 2012, mm -hmm. Google said that we're going to be charging for the platform. Yeah, And that kind of flipped our world upside down. Because it's it's not a huge company, you know. It's uh, as of today a ten million dollar a year ecom, and having just you know come in with a big bill from Google every single month that we never had before, that was a huge Each challenge. Each your profits, yeah. Understanding how to raise prices intelligently while not losing the consumer, still having a good amount of CRO mm -hmm. uh, onto the site. So we had to just change our focus on what we were doing rather than just being able to live off of Google Shopping. I mean, I can remember that was a nice time. It was free. It just brought all this business that... They sucked you in, then you have to keep oh, using yeah, them after. Yeah, sale. Just, you know, we kind of like sat back, hung out. Things were great. Uh, and then we really needed to get serious. And the same thing happened for Autoplicity as well. So we had a little bit change of what we were doing uh, from our core values as a company. And we change stuff around, and we are where we are today. So, Eddie, what about, you know, when you're dealing with these expensive products, how do you manage the cash flow side of things? Do you have to get outside financing, or is it drop shipped? How, do you, how does that work? So, we are primarily drop shipped. Uh, we do use fulfillment centers. We also do hold our own inventory, uh, just something that we've built over time that's been reinvested into the company. Uh, you know, for those who are starting out, the, your Amex Plum is still a very viable way to start a business. I don't particularly suggest to go into debt yourself. You know, after doing this for so long, I'm a big proponent of build did a. Did you start it on a credit card? Or how did you? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Not not exactly proud of it. You know, if we can go back in time, I would build a plan, raise money, and you then, would. Yeah, I mean, your biggest constraint in any business is cash flow right. and lack of funds. Yeah. So. I want to be able to raise money and make big plays. Uh, you know, when you don't raise money, when you run, like most people run an experiment for a month, right? Or you need at least a thousand results. Yeah. We would do things within a day, an hour. You watch it and go, is it working? Is it not? You just, you can't afford right. to have it go any longer because you lose too much money if right. the experiment is going Hey, like, what's an experiment that you were like scared to do that you thought could be a big play? A million times we, a million times we ran uh, just like pricing algorithms and what would work, what would not to raise margin. And you just, we would sit there for hours thinking of something up and then put it in play 
And then literally the next morning, I would have my partner call me and go, okay, yeah, that, this isn't working. I just looked at it. I would look at it too and go, okay, we need something new. So we would do that for about a month. We came up with at least 30 different approaches within one month time. You know, you test like up to 100 things, uh, uh, 100 events at yeah. most. Just because you didn't have the ability to do anything else. So that was a really stressful time. Those yeah. are some crazy things to do. Or from the perspective of marketing, like look what I did with TH Motorsports. You know, we sunk in a ton of money into racing. It brought no ROI. The show never went live. We got That's into painful. Oh, yeah. We got into magazines. Magazines were pretty much dead. No one looked at it. We had like a six-page spread in the coolest magazine for sport wow. compact. Nothing. It's good for social proof. I guess <laughs> that's about it, right? You no, know, we have a plaque hanging on the wall. That we got sent, <laughs> like, you know, like pictures out of It's an magazine. expensive plaque, right? Yeah, it's a very expensive plaque. What about um, what paid advertising works well? What should people try out? I mean, your first and foremost, your strongest thing is going to be if you're reselling products, try PLA slash Google Shopping. Mm -hmm. If it's your own product, uh, CPC. I mean, that's your numero uno. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to mimic the same thing, the Amazons of the world, including Amazon and eBay, are going to be your two strongest. Uh, then trailing off to, you know, like Rakuten slash yeah. buy.com. I still yeah. like to buy .com. You have some opinions on that on Quora. Like you, you, you say you don't love buy.com and Rakuten. Right? I don't love that you took one of the best names, one of the best URLs that would ever exist and change it to a name that no one in the U.S. would know. What do you mean? Uh, just kind of a... A difficult thing where, you know, buy.com, so easy to remember. Oh, Rakuten, you mean? And yeah, and then you change it to Rakuten. And I know they did that. They have Japanese ownership, right? That's the background of uh, it. Ah, I see what you mean. Yes. And like, I get it from, you know, an honorary perspective. And I'm sure Rakuten makes a lot of sense in Japan, which just doesn't make any sense. Yeah. In, in the US versus buy.com. Yeah. That was it. It was just a yeah. name. Name type thing. I can keep going for three hours. I hear footsteps. So how much time do we have before you? Someone's not late for work. Uh, well, I think we have about another ten fifteen. Okay, you just tell me. Um, okay. So challenges with autoplicity because it seems like on that trajectory, I'm thinking what what challenges could someone have going from zero to fifty million? Uh, data. Yeah. Data, data, data. Uh, and then managing a supply chain that large. So Autoplicity has 8 million parts available. That's crazy. Yeah. Uh, out of them, about 1.2 or 1.3 million are physically in stock somewhere, unique. And then we have a lot of product as well that you can purchase that comes directly as like a build from the manufacturer, yeah. which is a pretty standard thing uh, in this industry. You know, suppliers will make only 10% of their products readily available. The rest they build on order. Mm. The big challenge was for us kind of on a twofold. So getting the data is really hard. Uh, automotive is a very old guard industry. So a lot of these manufacturers, they don't have box sizing. So they haven't cubic scanned anything ever. They don't know what fitment they have for their parts when new stuff comes out, they don't update you. So for us to build a catalog where the number one most important thing you can have for an automotive site is a vehicle configurator. Mm. So someone needs to jump on the site, say, I have car XYZ. I have the year, I have the make, I have the model. Exactly. Show me what works with this car. Yeah. And that's where you run into a big issue just because a lot of times customers think that it's our inadequacy, that we have – you know, bad data, we led them in the wrong direction. But in reality, it's the manufacturers don't even know. And the manufacturers, a lot of times, are just supplying from China or, you know, from somewhere overseas. Yeah. They're getting this giant catalog of stuff that yeah. has bad fitment on it. So getting that images, descriptions, I mean, you're putting together this massive catalog, which has been a huge undertaking. Yeah. It's a challenge of our company. And that's one of the things that sets us uh, aside from the rest of the competition, you know, you can get into the automotive world, but to build 
the size of a catalog that we have is very hard. You know, yeah. and we sell on Amazon, and Amazon asks us for data. Mm-hmm. You know, that's one of the very interesting things that you know we were talking in the beginning about building your own brand. Right. Companies like Amazon have this beautiful model where they have the marketing power, so they tell you, "Hey, give us the data." Well, you'll be the unique seller for it. Mm. And you are for a little bit of time until someone else matches up with that ASIN or SKU on your side. And that's it. And then you're, they're just, then you're competing on price. Then you're competing on price yeah. and you've given the data up that was unique to you that you bought out. Um, so does I, that end up being a good thing? or a, I, you know, I think at the end of the day, yeah. it's going to come out one way or the other. It's going to so, happen. So you might as well just be the first. Yeah, hoarding it. <laughs> is not really going right. to be the big driver. You know, just be on the cusp yourself. Yeah. With 8 million products, we have tons of room for improvement. Yeah. So that was the big challenge when yeah. it came to autoplicity on the data side. Yeah. Uh, and then on the flip side, you had management. So coming from TH Motorsports, we were in four different platforms, four or five, you know, like the Subaru WRX, Nissan 350Z, which coupled with an Infiniti G35, now there's the 37, the Nissan 370Z, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, Hondas and some Mitsubishis. So we were pretty much specialists. Now you're throwing at us 8 million parts, and we have to be specialists in everything. Yeah. So we're a parts counter. Yeah. Uh, with that, you know, just on the side of helping people out, that's already a difficult aspect. Yeah. But then you have a lot of different suppliers, and these suppliers are different sizes. So some use a very rudimentary form of uh, order processing. So we'd have to tailor our own custom software to make sure it worked with them. Everyone has a different EDI software passed on those orders, right. get track numbers back, automating. Everyone works in a different way. So you're really managing it's kind of like babysitting a lot of different people right. and making all of that work. So that was a huge challenge in an undertaking. Uh, I suggest for someone who is bootstrapped, raise some cash before you can do something like that because if you don't have a really talented team yeah. on board, which we were very lucky to do yeah. so, uh, you know, being bootstrapped, yeah. it would have never worked. Yeah. Talk about that for a second, Eddie, the talented team, right? You have a team of people. How how many people does it take to manage and run Autoplicity? Sure. So we are currently in uh, with some contractors in the mid thirties for employee size. Uh, we don't warehouse that much, so we only have a couple people there. Where you usually see in automotive companies, they have you know, which are somewhere around our size, have like eighty to one hundred employees. Most of that you see is just in the warehouse if they're building something, right? out there from the management perspective yeah. uh, i have my fantastic partner he is our cto and ceo all or co-ceo all at the same time that's sean uh, and yep and then i'm more on the biz dev procurement side yeah. so i've loved that side of the business forever i love dealing with people yeah. uh and the rest of our team how do you find how do you meet sean Ooh, we have a cool story about that i know we're running low on time but uh, when I was running TH Motorsports, he actually had an e-com that was competing against us. Ah, and, and so uh, what happened? We thought we were really pretty much kind of like... So you hated each other. You were enemies. Well, they were kicking our butts. Mm. Uh, and it came out of kind of nowhere. And I'm always the first person to partner with my enemy, technically, rather than... <laughs> Make... F- yeah. So... I contacted him and saw and asked him. It was on Facebook back in the day when you can just message anyone you want, and it doesn't go into like some filtered inbox. Right. And I just said, I'm really humbled by what you guys are doing there at your company. And uh, I found him on page like 17 of Google on some forum. He had his own blog post about going off roading in uh, what was it, a Discovery? Yeah, it was in Land Rover Discovery. And I messaged him and I said, Hey, you know do you have any software that maybe you can share with us? We'd love to lease it. You guys are doing great. And he actually responded to me and said, you know, I just left this company. Mm. Uh, and I'm kind of in, you know, in limbo right now looking at what to do. And uh, I, I knew it right there. And then I'm like, I got to get this guy. So yeah. I flew him down to Chicago. Where is he had, from? Uh, so he's an Orange County guy. Okay. So he's a California side. And flew him down and 
we had a, just a ton of fun. Yeah. So tell me about the brainstorm. So you're brainstorming at this point, right? What you can do together. Yeah, we took the model of what they had. So I saw that he was very heavy on the software side. He comes from a technical background. Uh, there's a site called Marine Depot. They're pretty much the leader, as far as I know, in anything that has to do with fish, aquariums, things of that nature. Okay. And he was pretty much their IT director. Hmm. You know, I didn't. I don't remember if he had like a VP or CTO role that was executive level. Right. Um, but their auto parts site was great, and it was closing down. It had the the ability to span in every single type of market. So we said, why don't we take your knowledge base? Yeah. And start building data. You know where to get data from, and I know suppliers. So we'll merge those suppliers. Yeah. So I'm going to bring, you know, what was it at the time? Seven years of buying power with a person and, and an entity who was able to build something out. You know, all from brand new, unique data. Yeah. And that's it. We kind of merged the two. And we yeah. became a powerhouse. So yeah. it was. Uh, you it took was your two top strengths and just combined them. Yeah, and even still to this day, we still work in that unison. So anyone, again, listening, if you find a partner, make sure that partner compliments you. If you both do the same thing, it is not good. Yeah. What's the toughest part about managing and leading staff now that you have like in the 30s? Sure. Uh, specifically that, never being acquainted with the prior you know, I was never groomed as a manager. I never worked anywhere. Uh, I, I literally went from the valley parking and selling random stuff. I worked for a couple of years as a runner or clerk uh, at the New York Mercantile Exchange. In New York, yeah. Learned, yeah, learned a little bit of grit there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. learned, basically learned not to make uh, mistakes ever <laughs> when it came to mathematical mistakes. And... Then afterwards, just running my business, so I've never had the ability to manage a staff. Right, uh, it's difficult. And what works for you? What's what's your style? Lead by example. Mm -hmm. So that's to me that's the easiest one. It's the one that I know the most. You know, I'm yeah. in the midst of actually trying to read up a little bit more on becoming uh, either a better project manager, or just a better leader overall. Yeah. Your skill set has to change. When your company grows, it has to change really quickly. You yeah. know, I, again, that's why I like raising capital because if you do that, you can hire people who are more talented than you in yeah. specific areas right away. If you yeah. need to be the brainchild, be the brainchild. You know, it's very hard to find a lot of Zuckerbergs in the world who can do from zero to yeah. multi billions. And you know that that is the same with us. Is at some point. You're gonna to want to hire a weathered CEO, right. you know, some ex McKinseyanite who's uh, ran, you know, a big company or something of that nature. Yeah. Now I know we're at some point gonna run out of time, so I, there's two things I want to talk about. One is the obvious question: is what are some of those key things you did to get from zero to fifty million in four years? And two, the software that you use, because I know you're using a lot of different. There's no way without software you can manage eight million different parts. In different ways. So, the what are some of the key steps or milestones that you saw with the zero to fifty million, which is a huge trajectory in just four years? So, since we are pretty close to some time, yeah. I will. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of wrap that and package it up. Yeah. Uh, the biggest milestones is data. So, if when we were talking originally about content, uh, content is content, fitment, and data in our world is the most important. So mm -hmm. when we get really good data for a brand uh, that we sell and then we can give specific descriptions, when the customer goes on the site and if they have a video on our site or they have a really good description, all the different details of what they need, that's when your conversion starts to go up. Mm -hmm. So as we keep improving data uh, and keep sourcing it from different suppliers, in that factor, we kept on growing. And, you know, I can talk about site speed for conversion. Uh, we've revamped the look of it multiple times. You know, we're really strong from an algorithmic, pers that algorithmic perspective on a pricing model of what we do internally, uh, how we go to market when we bid for Google Shopping or PLA, CPC, 
I mean, there's just like this whole myriad of things. Right. So we, can, we, we would need another like hours, hours and hours to discuss of how you kind of ramp that up. Right. Uh, in regards to some of the software that we use, this is where I want to kind of, you know, inject and plug in uh, software like Rejoiner. Right. You know, I love that software. I came on board as a late co-founder to that company specifically because I liked it. It was like the hair club for men. If anyone remembers the hair club for men commercials, where the guy at the end goes, I'm not only the president, I'm also a client. Right, right. That was exactly it. I was the client of the company. It was tiny when we started. It was all self-serve. And I loved the team. And the team was just a co-founder at the time. There were a few others. They're no longer there. But that was a person who I interacted with. He was such a great guy. And I loved the person and the product. The product was easy to install. Like I think we got up and running in like ten minutes. Hmm. It's literally just Java, and that helps capture abandonment. That right? ori- originally, yeah, originally the business was based on just abandonment side. So we would capture at the cart level and then re- uh, do a drip campaign and remarket to the customer uh, via email. Now we've transformed the company completely. We do pre and post purchase marketing. Uh, we are bringing on just like full-blown lists if you want to do it with us, and we're full service. So we take all the CRO knowledge and put it together uh, between all of us, you know, a bigger team originally than when we started. And what I love doing with using the Rejoiner software on our site is that we can always trigger-based appeal to our clients and send them that specific email that they need rather than doing just like a giant blast that's, Pretty traditional in today's day and world, and works pretty well. But you know, if you have a high volume and with so many different products, we would need to hire just hundreds of people in every segment to write content. This way, we're able to systematically yeah. approach people and get them to shop with us and have that good feeling, yeah. whether it be before the purchase or afterwards. Yeah. Well, you guys will have to chat with Skubana at some point because I think you have similar customers because they do more the automation, inventory management, SKU profitability, that kind of thing. Yeah. What other software do you use that you like for the business? Uh, so to be honest with you, we're, I think we, maybe because we're Midwest boys, uh, some of us, we're very, not just frugal when it comes to software, third-party SaaS, but being in the industry itself, I know there's a lot of fluff. So we actually build a lot of it ourselves. Internally. Yeah. Uh, our... OMS is built. Well, because you have a good CTO, right? Yes, we do. Yeah. We have a fantastic CTO. So that's why we're able to build a lot of things in-house. And I don't always recommend it to yeah. everyone. Well, what's a key thing or the type of thing that you've built in-house that you're like, we need this? Because that's a lot of time and resources for an important person in your company, right? Yeah. So the, what, what was top of? Our OMS is probably the mo- one of the most important things we've ever built. For order management, I mean, you can't get any more detailed than that. Uh, we need it to be customizable, as I was saying. We have so many different You built that from scratch. Yeah. We have a lot of vendors who request a lot of different types of data, a lot of different types of communication, and we have different service levels that work with each one of them. So we have to have something that's custom-tailored to us. Yeah. And having that in as powerful of a state that it is, I'm not going to get into the details of it. Yeah. It really just makes our lives amazing when it comes to day to day process. Yeah. That's Eddie, about it. If you want to find something up, because I do have to go. Yeah. Eddie, do your thing. Where can we point people towards? Where should they check out, check you out online? Uh, go on Quora. And Quora. always, yeah, you're welcome to visit our sites, but check out, you know, yeah. I'm sure a lot of people on this blog. We have uh, rejoiner.com, autoplicity.com, thmotorsports.com, but you have some really rich, content rich. Posts that you've uh, answered on Quora, uh, take people a look should at check that. out. If, yeah. You know, if you just want to see kind of my yeah. point of view, but take a look at. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of Rejoiner. Yeah. Take a look; it's really cool. Eddie, absolute pleasure. Thanks uh, so much. Jeremy, thanks a lot, man. You enjoy your time.